Hello, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? All right. Uh, my name is Taylor Gorning with Round Tower Technologies, and we are really excited to be part of this event and be here. Um, Round Tower is headquartered in Cincinnati. Uh, we're a private firm. We're one of the fastest growing organizations in the country. Um, we're on the Inc. 5000 list for the last eight years, which uh, actually is a pretty exclusive club. It's uh, under 1% of companies that are part of that uh, club. And my mission is pretty simple. So I lead a team in this region to uh, help our clients realize the value of technology and helping them with their objectives, goals, and outcomes. And uh, when it comes to health care, when it comes to the aging population, that outcome is ensuring uh, that our seniors are uh, prosperous and they're safe and they're independent. So um, I'm here to uh, introduce uh, a panel that's going to be talking about how technology impacts the aging population, or actually two people, not a panel. I guess you could call that a panel. Um, and uh, certainly technology impacts everything we do and uh, in every single uh, part of our lives. And uh, that's not any different for the uh, aging population. So the challenge is what we look at as normal things we do on a daily basis can be, uh, you know, big obstacles for our seniors. So I'm here to introduce uh, Andy Craig and Austin, Austin Gresham. Andy is with Maple Knoll Communities. They're a non-for-profit, and uh, they are a, a, a continuing um, health organization for uh, retirement communities. And in partnership with Round Tower, they leverage technology, specifically IoT, and uh, cloud uh, optimization and automation to serve their residents um, so they can become more independent and safe and secure. So um, glad you're here. Hope you find it productive. And uh, thanks for coming. I'll hand it over to Austin. All right, I'm going to walk around a lot, so I'm not going to sit on this stage. And I don't think uh, Andy is either. So I'm Austin Gresham. I'm with Round Tower. Uh, I'm a consultant in our digital and IT transformation organization. Um, we're going to tag team the presentation. Uh, the front half, I'm going to talk to you about uh, digital transformation and specifically some of the technologies that you hear about uh, in either the panel that we were just, uh, just listening to earlier. You read about it in pretty much every publication, things like uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, augmented reality, virtual reality, like what, what, are, what are these things? What do they mean for us? Um, and not just chasing the new shiny technology object. So how do, we, how do we use these things for business? Very specifically, how do we use these things in healthcare to really help the outcomes, whether that's a business outcome, a patient outcome, right? There's so many different facets of, of technology in the healthcare world. I'm going to skip over that because no one cares. Uh, I will just say I live in Columbus, Ohio, which is one of our regional offices. I was born and raised here in Louisville. I grew up in Crestwood, moved out of here uh, in 1991 when there really was no IT in Louisville to speak of, and uh, married a local girl and got stuck there. And now I look back at what Louisville's done in the last 25 plus years. It's, it's absolutely amazing, especially on the health care side. So first thing I want to do is talk about um, digital transformation. Um, as, as was mentioned on the panel, the, world, the word digital uh, gets bounced around so much, it's, it's kind of lost its meaning in a lot of contexts. But fundamentally, digital transformation is changing the way that you, no matter what business you're in, how you deliver value to your customers. So in healthcare, those customers might be payer organizations, they're very specifically your patients uh, in the retirement community, it's your seniors, it's your residents. So how you deliver whatever it is that you deliver, how do you use technology to fundamentally change how you're delivering that? So notice I don't really say anything about um, blockchain or augmented reality or IoT, right? It's, it's very much less about the technology. Uh, the big thing now is that technology this rapid acceleration in technology is what's enabling businesses to go do these new and interesting things that we just simply couldn't do before. Uh, but really, ultimately, digital 
is just fundamentally changing the way you deliver that to your customers. So I'm going to give a uh, somewhat brief history lesson. This slide I talk to a lot, and I could probably talk for 30 minutes about this slide. It doesn't say much, but actually says a lot. The big thing I want you to, to take away from this, um, has anybody heard about the four industrial revolutions? Is that in a trade publication, right? It's kind of all over the place. So these are the four industrial revolutions going way, way back to the 1700s when we introduced steam engines into pretty much the entire economy prior to that was based on agriculture. And then all of a sudden came the, the industrial revolution that we've all read about in, in grade school where we actually started to make things and there were these big factories that were created. And those factories were powered by water wheels. So they built these big factories next to these rivers. This giant water wheel was turned by the power of the river and it ran the factory. And then in the mid 1700s, somebody introduced this new thing called a steam engine. And people were kind of scratched their heads like, well, what is that going to do for me? I don't quite understand it. So they simply eventually unplugged the water wheel from the end of their factory and plugged a steam engine where the water wheel used to be and went on about their day. And that happens throughout each of these industrial revolutions. When we introduced electricity, people simply unplugged the steam engine and put an electrical motor on there. When we introduced computers, slightly different model, they didn't unplug the, <laughs> the electrical motor and put a computer on the end, but we started to run our businesses using computers. But what each of these industrial revolutions has in common is that when these technologies were introduced, people really didn't understand how to fundamentally change their business. They took existing business models, existing processes, and just plugged this new technology into it. And if you put that in context for today, so starting in about 2015 is what most people consider the beginning of this fourth industrial revolution, also the, called the digital revolution. And you hear it on the stage earlier, probably in, in your own circles, people really still are kind of scratching their heads. Like, what do, we, what do we do with analytics? What do we do with blockchain? What do we do with augmented reality? Um, and in many cases, people are just taking existing business processes plugging in this new technology like cloud computing and thinking, okay, we're good, but they really haven't done anything different. So that's one of the things that all four of these revolutions have in common is that it took a while for people to really figure out how to use these things in new and interesting ways. The other thing that they have in common, which is, is kind of a non-commonality, is as you can see from the timelines, the time it took for people to adopt those technologies is shrinking roughly in half every time. It took about 100 years for steam, about 50 for electricity, about 25 for computers. And if you think about the digital, techno the, uh, the digital revolution starting about four years ago, you've probably heard of companies that didn't even exist three or four years ago that are now the pioneers of, of their particular industry, right? Especially, there's a lot of healthcare companies out there that are purely digital healthcare, healthcare companies, uh, telemedicine. Uh, there's probably eight zillion analytics companies out there that are saying they've got the magic silver bullet to help you, uh, you know, reduce patient readmissions and all these other things. People are creating these businesses because of these digital technologies that they simply couldn't create before that. So the rate of adoption is getting so much faster. Um, and the other thing that these uh, revolutions had in common is that in the beginning, because people didn't understand how to use those technologies, they relied on consultants and, and the quote unquote experts to help them figure out how to use these things. You know, it's kind of almost unimaginable to think that someone wouldn't know how to use a steam engine, but 300 years ago, right, this was something brand new and people were like, holy cow, what do I do? So they would hire consultants to come in. Uh, if you've ever read about the electrification, right, Edison and, and uh, some of these others that fought over competing standards, if that sounds familiar in IT, right, whenever the, a new thing comes out, there's no standards in the beginning and eventually somebody wins out, you know, Betamax, VHS, I'm dating myself a lot when I say that. Um, but we are in this digital revolution, which is basically um, what's creating this lift and this massive acceleration in technology. So kind of internalize and think about that. When you're, when you're in one of these revolutions, 
you don't kind of realize it, but then you look back in history, and someday we're going to look back at 2015 and go, wow, that was the digital revolution. How stupid were we? And now we're, you know, in flying saucers and going to Mars and all kinds of crazy things. So when you think about digital, um, who is it that's actually taking advantage of digital transformation? People ask me all the time, are, are we behind? You know, is our, is our competitor ahead of us? Uh, and if you look on the far right, that light gray box is the percentage of each of these verticals that's actually reaping financial benefit from digital technologies. Notice that healthcare is number one. And this slide is a couple, uh, it's about maybe six, eight months old from Gartner. So that num those numbers are changing. But healthcare is at the top of people taking advantage of digital technologies for actual business benefit. Um, if you were listening to the panel discussion earlier, government, although it's really, really small, government is starting to pick up on how they better serve their customers, which, you know, if you live in, uh, in Metro, you are the customers of the city government or the Metro government. How do they deliver services to you better? How do they deliver them more efficiently? Uh, you heard them talking about clean air monitors, like things that never existed five, ten years ago? How can they continue to encourage people to move into the city because of all the benefits that you get from living here? Uh, and then there's a host of other ones, right? Manufacturing, financial services, but it's very interesting that, that healthcare is, is right at the top of this. Um, another question I get is, how pervasive is digital in our everyday life? So I, uh, again, I'm going to date myself. I've been married 20 years as of today, but instead of being back home, I'm here in, in, uh, in Louisville. But I just got back from my 20-year anniversary trip to Aruba, which was fantastic. But I walked by this place and, and scratched my head. So you can pay for a ticket to Aruba, go stay at a really fancy hotel on the most beautiful water you'll ever see, but then you can pay even more money to sit down with a VR headset and take a tour of Aruba on a virtual headset if you just don't feel like driving around the island, which by the way is only like 19 miles by three miles. You can drive the whole thing in about 15 minutes without traffic. But I thought this was amazing. Like in Aruba of all places, you can sit down and, and have a VR experience at the mall. So this is how pervasive this stuff is becoming. So what are the drivers of digital transformation uh, in healthcare specifically, and you guys have probably all heard about a lot of these technologies. Um, telehealth is, is huge, um, and as they were also talking about on stage, there are so many different versions of telehealth. Uh, my company happens to use one called Teladoc, where on my mobile phone, if I, don't, if I don't want to go to the Minute Clinic or wherever, I can pull up my phone, connects me with a doctor, I can have a conversation, they can actually prescribe medicine, uh, via that channel, which is completely unheard of. Um, if you're in an underserved area, you may not have access, uh, mobility access to a doctor. Um, you can use telehealth to be able to have a conversation with a healthcare practitioner from your own home. So this is something that is absolutely driving outcomes. Uh, anybody in the, in the healthcare industry knows that, especially in underserved populations, uh, most people use the emergency room as their primary care physician because they don't have one, and that's really expensive. It's expensive for them, it's expensive for the payer, it's expensive for the hospital. It doesn't benefit anyone. Um, so telehealth is becoming one of those uh, technologies that's really helping that situation. AI machine learning, those things are everywhere. It's like peanut butter and jelly. Um, Basically, what's driving the, the AI and ML is access to data. And again, if you're listening to the, the panel discussion earlier, data is everything. Uh, running analytics on bad data doesn't get you anywhere, uh, doesn't get you a better outcome. Uh, running analytics on no data definitely doesn't give you an outcome. The ability to access, process, collate, and, and actually get meaning out of data is, is huge, and that's for so many different use cases, and we'll talk about some specific to, to Maple Knoll in, the, in a little bit. Uh, wearables and IoT. So we're going to talk mostly about IoT today. Uh, wearables is a version of IoT, which is the Internet of Things. Uh, how many people have some type of fitness tracker 
whether it's a Fitbit or a Garmin, that's, that's a wearable. There's also obviously wearable glucose monitors, there's wearable heart rate monitors. I mean, wearables are becoming uh, very ubiquitous uh, in our world right now. And the internet of things, which again, I'll talk about in a minute, is what's driving wearables. Uh, mobility and cloud access, this is a huge one. The ability to process data anywhere in the world without being tied to a specific location is, is big, right? The mobility side, if you rewind, you know, 15 years ago, slightly less than 15, no one had a smartphone, right? The iPhone only came out in 2007. Before that, there really was no smartphone, and now everybody has a smartphone. And in fact, even in those underserved populations I was talking about earlier, those people may not have a car, but they have a phone. So how do we take advantage of that massive, pervasive mobility and use technology to serve those people better? And then the last one is empowered consumers. Uh, being in IT for as long as I have, I can remember when, you know, 25 years ago, you would buy uh, a big, and it's probably the same with EMRs today, but you would buy a big um, CRM package like SAP or PeopleSoft, and you would go to do these implementations that would take years and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, big investments, long, long time to value, and at the end, typically, you didn't get what you thought you were gonna get because it took 24 months to get there, and by that time, all the requirements changed, but you couldn't change because you were committed to this roadmap for two years. Now, people are used to that whole smartphone app store experience. They're not gonna wait. 24 months or 18 months for you to come out with some new way of, of connecting with your, your residents or your, uh, your patients. They're gonna go on the app store, they're gonna find something for a dollar or free that meets 90% of their needs. And if they don't like it, they can swipe it away and download the next one and try that out. So consumers are seeing this all over and they just won't stand for companies that they work and interact with. They, won't, they can't handle not being um, satisfied quickly. So what is the Internet of Things, which is what we're going to talk about mostly with, uh, with the Maple Knoll uh, project that we're doing. It's simply taking an everyday device and connecting it somehow so that it can send and receive data. That's pretty much it. A thermostat, a watch, a shoe, uh, you know, a glucose monitor, whatever it might be, giving it some type of connectivity, usually wireless connectivity of some kind, and allowing it to send and receive data. And that's, that's it, everyday objects embedded with technology. The big thing that I want you to take away from IoT is that it blurs, and you might see this quote a lot, but I'll, I'll kind of solidify it for you. It blurs the lines between the physical and the digital world. So if any of you have been in healthcare for a long time and you can remember way back before EMRs, everything was paper charts, everything was handwritten, you can't run analytics on a paper chart, impossible. Once you digitize that paper chart and put it into a system that can now be analyzed, you've opened up a whole new world of opportunity to do something with that data. IoT is the same thing for physical properties, things like temperature, heart rate, um, the new, the new uh, Apple Watch can even do an ECG right, right from your fingertips. The technology is unbelievable what it can do these days, but the big, big value prop for IoT is being able to take some kind of physical property, whatever it is that you want to measure, and digitizing that so that you can go do something with it that you could never do before. So a uh, quick technology lesson for IoT. Um, people tend to focus on the tech, on the sensors. Do I want you know, this monitor or that monitor? Do I want this temperature, temperature sensor, that temperature sensor, whatever it happens to be? Uh, the bottom line is that the, the T, the things in IoT over here on the far, my far right, your left, um, those are peanuts. They don't really add the value in the equation. The value in IoT is on the far right, which is taking that data and actually acting on it. You can have sensors all over your hospital collecting data 
and it can go into some big cloud data lake and right, all the IT people are happy because they sold you a bunch of stuff to go store your data. But if you're not doing something with the data, it's completely meaningless. So all the, all the stuff that's being collected on the left is meaningless without going and doing something on the right. And again, that's where things like AI, machine learning, uh, analytics, right, as, a, as an umbrella, that's where people are struggling is they're running these analytics projects, but they don't really know what the end result's supposed to be. They don't know what they're gonna go do with that data once they analyze it. So taking action is critical. And there's all kinds of things in the middle. Um, the one I'll touch on is called edge computing. Has anybody heard of edge computing? So I'll, I'll put it in a, in a real world example. If you think of a Tesla automobile with autopilot, you've got hundreds of sensors on that car, right? taking readings all the time, every millisecond to make a decision about what that car is gonna do with the autopilot. If you have to take that data and send it over a mobile network to the cloud, have it analyze and then send the results back to the car, you've probably already run over someone or run through a red light, right, or gotten in an accident. You can't wait that long. Milliseconds matter, so the car has more computing power than probably most data centers did 15 years ago. It does all the analytics in the car, and then later it sends data up to the cloud for Tesla to consolidate and analyze and do more cool things with, but the decisions are all made right there. So if you think about, like on your phones, if you use Siri or Google Assistant, right now when you're speaking into the phone and you're having it do voice recognition, it's, notice there's always a little bit of a delay because nine times out of 10, it's sending that to the cloud, running the analytics and sending the result back. The phones now are becoming much faster, more memory, more CPU, that those analytics are gonna run on the device for instant access, you don't even need a connection anymore. So that's what edge computing is. And that's gonna become very critical for things like telehealth and telemedicine, uh, when you have people in remote areas that are having analytics run on them, you know, heart rate, pace, all these other things that are trying to generate an outcome. You don't wanna have to send that to the cloud. They may not even have cloud connectivity, but you need it to be running there to do those analytics in real time. So what can you do, do with IoT? Um, there's some simple things you can do. Uh, if anybody has, uh, you know, Wemo motion sensors or anything like that, you can, turn on your lights, you can change the temperature in your house if you have like an Ecobee or a Nest. Um, for medical settings, uh, we're doing some projects with asset tracking, which sounds really simple. It's put a little tag on a thing and so you know where that thing is. But if you think about objects like, uh, you know, gurners and gurneys and stretchers, uh, portable ultrasound machines, people operationally waste a lot of time going to find those things throughout the hospital. How about if you knew right away where those things were? You pull up maybe an app on your phone or there's a monitor right there and you say, where's the nearest portable ultrasound? Oh, it's in that closet two doors down. Instead of running halfway across the hospital to go get one and wasting precious time. Another thing that we did, uh, we did a project uh, with portable ultrasounds because they were literally walking out the door of the hospital. Um, and those are really expensive machines. So we put GPS enabled devices on them. So now if they leave the vicinity of where they're supposed to be, somebody gets an alert. And not only do they get an alert that it's gone, they now know where it is. So it's almost like an Apple or a Google Maps. They can see the little blue dot moving around and they can go find that ultrasound machine. So there's some, some real like operational savings. And on the security side, alerting you if there's someone in an authorized area uh, or like when, when we had our first baby years and years ago, they had little RFID bracelets, and if they went out of the, the NICU, all the bells would go off, right? They couldn't track the baby. They just knew that it crossed over that threshold, but you know, if you ran fast enough, maybe you could get away. Now, uh, if anybody's had a baby in the last few years, those things are so much better now. They know where in the hospital the baby is, they know everything about the baby, and it's tracking things like their pulse and all these other things. So. That technology has come a long way. So I'm gonna talk about some real world examples real quick. How much time do I have? Oh, I'm almost over. I'll go through, uh, I'll skip over some of these, although they're really cool. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this one with Merck. Um, so Merck ran this thing called the, uh, the Alexa Diabetes Challenge a few years ago. So they, they did a couple of really interesting things. One is they partnered with Amazon to offer a $250,000 prize 
to helping people with type 2 diabetes manage their diabetes better using technology and very specifically using Alexa because this was an Amazon thing. So they partnered with Amazon. They offered this $250,000 purse. And the company that won was this product called SugarPod, which is a scale uh, that's pictured on the left that has an Alexa built into it. The cool thing about on the left is when you stand on the scale on your bare feet, it scans your feet and uses machine learning and analytics to determine if you have the presence of foot ulcers, which are leading indicators of some more serious issues, especially for type 2 diabetics. So it can then alert you. You need to go to the doctor. Uh, maybe it's bad enough you need to call the ER or the, you know, the ambulance potentially, but that helps people that something that they would normally have to go into their doctor's office to be able to even figure out. But it also has voice integration with Alexa. So you can do these really cool things like ask it questions. Um, you know, hey, I'm feeling lethargic today. What's the problem? Alexa is then also connected to your, uh, your health monitoring app, your food tracking app. It can say, hey, dummy, you ate, you know, half a quart of ice cream earlier. Your blood sugar's through the roof. Your glucose monitor's tell me it can't keep up. Maybe you should lay off the sugar for a bit. You know, those types of consultative things that normally you would have to call a practitioner. Um, so that's one uh, real world example of IOT. The second one is with hip replacements. Anybody in the medical field know what necrosis is? So the, the, the um, analogy I like to use is that if you've ever done woodworking or even just tried to build something and you've drilled into a piece of wood and the wood starts to smolder because you, you push too hard or the drill bit was too fast, that's necrosis. So it literally kills bone tissue when you're doing operations like hip replacements, one of the biggest problems is that if the doctor isn't precise enough, it can cause necrosis, and that causes this um, steel ball and joint thing not to adhere properly to the hip, and then they have uh, post-op problems. They have to come back in, very expensive. So this company, IntelliSense, actually added IoT to a medical drill that monitors some things in real time. It monitors the pressure that the, the operator is putting on the drill. It monitors the rotational speed of the drill bit and the temperature at the tip of the drill bit and can predict necrosis before it happens. And then there's actually actuators built into the drill that will slow down the rotation automatically or it will back off on the pressure so that you don't cause that necrosis. Uh, some of the more other versions are actually, they can tell you when you're through the first layer of bone and down into the next layer, there's so many cool things that they're doing. But this is another real world example of using analytics, machine learning, internet of things to actually affect a, a real world problem. So I will stop there because I'm a couple minutes over and I will hand it over to Andy from Maple North. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Austin. Great presentation. So we're working with Round Tower uh, at Maple Knoll Village. Has anyone ever heard of Maple Knoll Village uh, in Cincinnati? So we're, we're a CCRC. Uh, we have a couple different campuses, a couple different HUD facilities. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about that. Um, this is me. I look pretty much the same, I hope. Uh, M Maple Knoll uh, Communities uh, we've been around for a while, so this year is actually 171 years for us. Uh, we've pretty much exclusively cared for older adults for the majority of this time. We had some, some times in our history where we would birth ba babies in a hospital uh, that was on our campus. We had some horrible names uh, in the past, like uh, the widow's home, uh, the home for uh, old women, uh, just really weird <laughs> things that would never fly today. Um, so luckily, I, I like Maple Knoll a lot better as a name. I don't know about you all. Um, these are some of the, the businesses that we operate. Uh, we're talking a lot today specifically about Maple Knoll Village, which is our main campus in Cincinnati. Uh, the Knolls of Oxford is another campus we have right off the campus of uh, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. 
And then we operate home health. Uh, Montessori Child Center is actually on our Maple Knoll campus. So we have a lot of intergenerational uh, experiences for our seniors and children. Uh, unique thing about us is we've, for quite some time, operated our own radio station. It's a public radio station, uh, locally broadcast and internationally streamed. So we have about 30,000 listeners a day, and all the programming is geared towards uh, senior citizens and the content that they enjoy. Um, on our main campus, we have about 1,000 residents throughout the full continuum. We have a lot of different neighborhoods, different styles. We have villas. We have apartments. Uh, we have an assisted living apartment, uh, pretty nice place. Um, what we're up against is the same thing that I think we're all up against, and I'm, I'm really uh, excited and, and pleasantly surprised with how much is happening here in Louisville when it comes to aging and innovation. It's my first time, I know it's only the second year of this conference, but it's my first time here, so I'm, I'm extremely impressed, excited, and enthused about everything that's going on here, because we're all facing the silver tsunami. You know, we, we all know what that is, which is you, if you just look at the graph, going back from 1900 to where we're gonna be here in about 20 year, uh, uh, 10 years, rapid growth in the population of people 65 and older. Uh, 10,000 people every day for several decades um, will be turning 65. So that is a massive growth, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Growing up in Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati is uh, very split between uh, German settlers and Irish settlers. Um, and my parents, my mom is German, my dad is Irish. Uh, they grew up four doors from each other, but they went to separate Catholic churches that were just around the block from each other, and one was for the Irish, one was for the Germans. And they're both one of eight kids. But all of those eight kids only had one or two kids. And so we're going to talk about the population a little bit, but you know that kind of describes the reason for for the growth and some of the problems we're going to face from a people standpoint with that growth. Uh, the population of physicians and doctors, so I spoke at a nursing conference, showed this slide, got yelled at because uh, I don't mean to, to focus on doctors. There's a lot of other lines we can draw up here about the rate at which doctors nurses, allied health professionals are entering the job market, but as all of you know, that rate uh, is not sufficient. And when you look at the, the very top lane, the line, the population of, uh, the population growth of people age 65 and older, tremendously higher. So when you kind of, if you draw like a squiggly line between the top line and the, the line at the top of the doctor's growth, you know, that's a, I call that a significant health care gap. That's essentially the silver tsunami, right? Uh, there's just not enough physicians. There's not going to be enough nurses. There's not going to be enough professionals in health care uh, to care for the amount of senior citizens that are going to be in the market and needing help, needing care, uh, if we don't do something different. Uh, we talked a little bit about the aging population. Uh, I know there's been some conversations throughout this conference as well. Um, but if you look at just the general population uh, and how that growth does not come close to keeping pace with the growth of the senior population, uh, so by next year, there's only going to be three and a half working age adults in the economy for uh, per senior citizen. So in a few decades, that's gonna to drop to two and a half working age adults in the economy. A lot of people see the slide and they say, oh, well, that's not a huge deal, but we're not talking about in healthcare, we're just talking about working age adults available. And I think if, if you work in senior living or healthcare, you know how hard it is to recruit and retain employees. Um, and so th this is gonna be another significant challenge that we face that's part of this silver tsunami. We've got a ton of senior citizens, a ton of people aging into retirement, and we don't have a ton of people available to provide care. We'll talk a little bit about life expectancy here on the left. You know, I think this is a great graph um, because it kind of shows over the course of time how the life expectancy in the U.S. and across the world, but this is specific to U.S. data, uh, how it's increased, modern medicine, technology. Uh, th that line continues to go in the right direction. 
Um, we've kind of hovered right below 80 in the U.S. Um, the opioid, opioid heroin epidemics kind of uh, keep that from growing at the rate that it could grow because a lot of young people die as a result, so it skews the number down a little bit. But people are living older. Don't we all want to live as long as, as we can? Of course, however, as part of this silver tsunami, um, as we age and the longer we live, the more likely we are to develop chronic conditions. And I think that was part of the, the session at lunch talking about um, chronic conditions and managing those conditions. The longer you live, the more likely you are to have multiple chronic conditions that need to be managed. At the same time, we go back a few slides and we're like, hey, there's not gonna be enough employees, not enough people in the workforce to really help manage people's conditions. So 80% of seniors over 65 will have at least one chronic condition and almost 70% will be managing two. So what have we done at Maple Knoll? So we've spent the last 10 years at Maple Knoll investing in technology and infrastructure and in preparation for where we have started to arrive and what we have started building. So we were one of the early adopters of Wi-Fi technology, of infrastructure build outs in retirement communities, taking on that responsibility. A lot of people thought we were crazy. Why are you building Wi-Fi for senior citizens? They'll never use it. And of course, this is a little over 10 years ago. Our goal was not to provide internet. That's just a perk. Our goal was to provide an infrastructure so that devices in the future could be brought online and that we could use those devices to help in their care and to help be proactive with their care. So that was actually our motivation for going with enterprise Wi-Fi on our senior living campuses. As a result, we created some standards that as we add devices um, that aid in the care of our residents, like PERS systems, things like that, if they don't operate on Wi-Fi, they can't be in our community. So that was an important step for us and one that a lot of people thought was, was risky. But, you know, although we've deployed some of these systems, um, they're proprietary in nature. They don't share a lot of data with other systems. They give us a lot of insight and data. They don't share a lot of data. And then you have multiple dashboards and platforms that staff are dealing with to use the information to provide the right type of care to the residents. So we think our future state is in the IoT ecosystem, and this is what we are building out now. Um, so as Austin said, the sensors uh, that are available in the world of IoT, they're just peanuts. They're necessary, they're useful, but that is not the core um, of what drives value in an IoT ecosystem, such as the one that we're building at Maple Knoll. So why do we want an IoT ecosystem? How do we present this to our residents? Well, it's really pretty simple. A lot of people assume senior citizens aren't interested in technology. We find that to be not true at all. They want technology that's easy to use, and they want technology that benefits them. So one of the key benefits for our residents is we want to use IoT to reduce hospitalizations. So if you've ever had a hospital stay, um, I I'm not, I can't imagine if I asked anyone to raise their hands, who was disappointed at time of discharge that you were leaving? Nobody. No one likes a hospital stay, but if you look at the data, the hospital stays can be detrimental to senior citizens, and oftentimes they leave the hospital more disabled and in worse condition than when they entered the hospital. So there, there's some key areas in IoT that we are focusing on with this project that we're building. So activities of daily living, very important. So what type of sensors from IoT can we use in activities of daily living? You see several of them up there, they probably all make sense, you're all familiar with them, but the one I always point out that people find very weird is toileting. Why do we want to track your toileting? Well, if you work with senior citizens, you know that UTIs are a common problem that create more serious problems. A UTI in a senior citizen can put them into a state of cognitive decline that makes them look like they have dementia or Alzheimer's, which then could cause them to wander in a harm's way and be injured or even worse. So just having a simple sensor in a toilet that monitors flushes in our world of IoT would create a baseline. With all the different devices we use for all these activities of daily living, we create a baseline so we understand what are their normal patterns. And then over time, if we see 
them veering away from that baseline, for instance, their toileting goes down, we can intervene early and say, give them a call, pay them a visit and say, we're noticing your toileting is declining. That's usually an indication of a UTI. Let's take you down to the clinic, see one of the docs, get a prescription, and you never run into the issues of cognitive decline and injuries that can result from that. Another area is health and well-being. Wearables, Austin talked about, we think that's gonna be key going forward. Uh, a lot of the telehealth devices that we're already familiar with that can feed into this IoT system. You know, these are devices that have existed forever, a blood pressure cuff, you could buy one at Walgreens or Walmart or online, and it hasn't changed for decades, except for the fact that they add a chip in there that now allows it to take the data from the reading and send it somewhere. And then the automation and artificial intelligence, machine learning, the uh, smart controls, the Alexa's, the smart lighting. We found the smart lighting for us was the low hanging fruit. 40% of the falls that we responded to in our community occurred at night, in the dark, on the trip from the master bedroom to the bathroom. So we have been able to dramatically reduce falls simply by adding smart lighting so that the lights dim up as soon as their feet hit the floor and light their path to the bathroom and including the bathroom lights. They can also use the Alexa voice activation. And sorry, I'm going through this stuff really fast, but I know the last session ran over. So we're trying to keep everyone on time. <laughs> That's all right. Um, Alexa is a big deal for our residents right now and as part of this project. They hate pendants. No one wants to wear a pendant, it's stigmatizing. So let's remove the pendant, at least for, while they're in the home. And if they fall, we have enough Alexas throughout their home where they can say, they can call for help and it connects them live with our uh, nurse desk. Medication reminders, we all know what happens when you miss medications. So this is really important and it's a really easy basic skill with Alexa. And then of course the, the social interaction that can reduce isolation through the use of these different types of devices like uh, Alexa or any of the other uh, video type of AI devices. So what do we want from this? We want to reduce hospitalization for our residents we want to increase their length of stay in an independent environment because no one wants to move to assisted living, no one wants to move to a SNF and pay double, triple, or sometimes even four times the amount, let alone be in that type of environment. Nobody wants that. So the sensors aren't really the big deal here. It's the analytics platform. It's understanding the data. It's taking all these sensors from different places and not having to have all these different apps and all these different dashboards, but being able to centralize this data and use machine learning to help our care staff take action. So we'll take a look at uh, what a, the dashboard looks like. This is uh, Janet Jones. Obviously, this has all been changed. This, no HIPAA violations here, so please don't report me. Uh, but this is what she looks like when things are normal. Everything's right at her baseline, whether it's her weight, the number of steps she takes according to her wearable, um, you know, her blood pressure, things like that. Everything's okay. Our staff doesn't need to know anything about Mrs. Jones at this point because she's fine. She's within her baseline. However, a week later, our staff gets alerted. There's some issues with Mrs. Jones. Her weight has declined. Her steps have declined. Some of her vitals are not where they should be. Intervention required. Call Mrs. Jones. Let's see what the problem is. We found out it's a missed medication easily rectifiable, avoid a hospital stay, avoid any type of injuries or further health issues. That was a lot to cover in a very short amount of time. Um, and I know as a result, we don't have time for open Q&A, but Austin and myself will stick around for anyone that wants to come up and speak afterwards. <laughs> one question, okay, I got, I got a minute for one question. Okay. Uh, through a visit. So the question was, how do we know that person missed their medication? So when our nurses visit that person, somebody is a lot better than me at speaking. <laughs> so, um, so, so it was through talking with that person in our clinic, bringing them down, understanding what their day looked like. Um, so we didn't use, at that point, any um, medication dispensers or anything like that, which has a play in this in this environment, but simply talking to them and understanding what their days have looked like and what may be causing this, and it was a mismedication. Yes? 
Um, so what's the number one challenge getting this off the ground? I've had that question before, and we're still getting this off the ground, just so people know. This is still in the early phases. So we're still getting this off the ground um, and trying to expand uh, throughout our campus and collect more data, things like that. So everyone assumes that I'm going to say, oh, the seniors don't like technology. That is not the case at all. Um, cost is an issue because we're kind of an early mover, early adopter. Cost is an issue. Um, and then security. Uh, so we've, put all, we've invested a lot actually in securing our environment more than what we had before because IoT and these devices, you have to really vet them and that takes some time because there's thousands of these devices on the market from so many manufacturers, most of which you've never heard of. You don't know if they patch their devices. You don't know if they're going to be around tomorrow to support the device. So that, that are, th those are the significant challenges to date. Good? One more. Yeah, so we are piloting this in independent living only at this point. And we're going from a small pilot to a pilot of 50 and then hopefully beyond that. Um, but that's how we're, we're starting off. Seniors are required to opt in, yes. Um, so th that's a great question. And their first question when we talk about this, they're not afraid of technology, they just wanna know their information is safe and that we're not installing cameras secretly. You know, that's always a concern, especially with motion sensors, they think there's a camera there. So we have to assure them that there's not. But by and large, people, when they think about in improving their length of stay in independence, staying out of the hospital, you know, th they'll take it. So I appreciate everyone's time. And I'll hand it back over uh, to Taylor. Andy Craig, Austin Gresham. Hopefully that was uh, helpful.